Carlisle was served by two railroads that eventually became branches of the Pennsylvania and Reading Railroads. There were at least four passenger stations in the town between 1837 and 1962. Randy will trace the development of the railroads in Carlisle and the passenger stations with a look at some other interesting facts relating to the railroads over the years. Randy resides in Boiling Springs with his wife, Laura, who is in the back of the room there standing. Um, she has helped him prepare and publish his earlier book, books on local railroads and local history. And just to let you know, we do have this book for sale today. Uh, it's $10. We have one. If you are interested, I have them at the front desk. You are more than welcome to come out there. And Randy has some. So if anybody would be interested in purchasing one, we have them available. Uh, Randy also created the walking tour of the Carlisle's 19th century firehouses for Cumberland County Historical Society and a new walking tour this year called One Block, 300 Years of Cumberland County. It is my pleasure to welcome Randy Watts. Let's get Randy started. Thanks. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. <clears throat> Sometimes I get overwhelmed by the technology. <laughs> As they say on national public radio or, or national public television, there is a companion book available. Linda touched on that. So you don't have to worry about taking notes today. I'm going to talk about the, the passenger stations in Carlisle, and I thought I maybe first would touch on the evolution of the railroad in Carlisle and kind of give the context. And the first railroad that came to Carlisle was in 1837. It was the Cumberland Valley Railroad. Opened in August of that year from the Susquehanna River to Carlisle. And as originally built, it came in somewhat parallel to North Street. It's still there. And it came into where the Weiss Market is, turned and came up High Street right through downtown Carlisle. When the railroad was originally built, some people wanted to put it up on North Street, but the town fought to put it down the center of High Street. <laughs> One of the interesting features, and I'll show a picture of it toward the end, was in order to keep the grade fairly level, there was a trestle that started in the area of the Weiss Market parking lot and came up just to the other side of East Street and formed kind of what the locals called the Chinese Wall, which is a, a pretty interesting feature. But that's the original right-of-way built in 1837 for the Cumberland Valley Railroad. That later goes into the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1919. The second railroad that came to Carlisle was the South Mountain Railroad. And that started in the area of East Step Electric, or Wenger's Foods, on East Lowler Street. And it built south. It, it crossed, went by Scales Restaurant, um, down behind the Lee Torch School, through Lee Torch Park, and went south to a place called Hunter's Run, and then it turned right and it went to Pine Grove Furnace. It was 17 miles long, and it was intended primarily to haul iron products out of Pine Grove uh, to connect with the Cumberland Valley. The juncture of the railroad initially, and I'll, I'll say this probably twice as I go through, initially was known as South Mountain Junction, because when you're at a junction, you name the place that you're going to. So you're going from the junction in Carlisle to South Mountain, so it was called South Mountain Junction. Later it becomes Gettysburg Junction. Carlisle Junction is in Mount Holly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Railroad logic. It's, it's pretty fascinating. There's some retired railroaders here. I'm sure we, they could tell a lot of stories. But just to worry, and so I'll go back and touch on this in a, a minute. This is the original right-of-way that came in. This is East Lowther Street. This would be kind of East Lowther Street extended the Big carpet mills are there now. This would be East Step Electric. This is the Cumberland Valley Railroad. It turned, went up through town. The South Mountain came south. This would be High Street. And this building that we'll see many times is Scales, just to kind of help orient you there. And we'll go back to this. So that was the second railroad. The third railroad that almost came to Carlisle but didn't was the South Penn Railroad or the South Pennsylvania Railroad. The South Pennsylvania Railroad is a pretty interesting story in and of itself. Parts of it later became the Pennsylvania Turnpike. But it was surveyed to run from Harrisburg in the area of Cameron and Paxton Streets, 
across the Susquehanna River, and there's still some piers visible just north of the Reading Railroad Bridge, it would have come pretty much in a straight line from Lemoyne through Chambers Gap, which if you ever hike the Appalachian Trail, there's a cemetery at Chambers Gap. It would have come across there, and then it would have come into Carlisle. I'll show the map in just a minute. And then proceeded almost in a straight line from Carlisle to the first tunnel of the turnpike at Newburgh. Would have been the right of way of the South Penn. Now that was surveyed through Carlisle in 1883. That was backed by two rather well-to-do individuals, Vanderbilt of the New York Central System, a guy by the name of Andrew Carnegie, who was America's first billionaire, uh, were behind this line. It was a pretty serious project. They spent uh, several million dollars and, and killed a number of people, to, but it was never completed. But when it surveyed through Carlisle, the Cumberland Valley Railroad then built over their survey lines. And I'll see if I can explain that a little bit better. When you look, the Carlisle line originally came in, as I said, at up High Street. The South Pennsylvania Railroad surveyed through Carlisle in 1883. The next year, the Cumberland Valley came in and they built what they called their freight bypass line. It started at a place that's now called Watts. Uh, for Frederick Watts, no relation, distantly a generation for two or two before Frederick, my family was related. One family became rich and famous, the others became drunks and horse thieves. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's any relationship, it's fairly distant. But at that juncture, they built the freight line, which is the existing railroad through Carlisle, and came back up to the subway and rejoined the Cumberland Valley Line. And what that did, was it gave them a bypass line. They now ran all the passenger trains up and down High Street, and all the freight trains went up the bypass line. And it made, in essence, two tracks through Carlisle. The rest of the railroad eventually, by 1922 or so, was double tracked the whole way from Lemoyne to Hagerstown. So that's where the, the freight line comes in, and that was the, the South Penn Railroad. Although only two railroads ever built, that was the the, the third railroad that played a role. As I said, the, the Cumberland Valley and the, the South Mountain Railroad Junction was South Mountain and Gettysburg. The railroad was built from Hunter's Run to Gettysburg in 1884, and when they did that, it made it a tremendously busy railroad. By that time, there was a large tourist trade and developed going to Gettysburg, and the main rail connection to Gettysburg came through the Cumberland Valley to Carlisle and then south to Gettysburg. The Western Maryland was also there, but that was a secondary line. And that became a very busy railroad, and. Um, very important location. So by 1884, what we end up with is the original Cumberland Valley line through downtown Carlisle, their freight bypass built in 1884, and then the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad that goes south to Gettysburg. The junction east of town, the Cumberland Valley used telegraph poles, and they used QN. I have no idea where the QN comes from, uh, but that, and I'll, I have pictures of that later. At the west end of the freight line was a place called WF, and there's a tower, I have a picture of that. That was later referred to as Cook, C-O-O-K-E. Not for the J. Cook, the railroad financier, but a clerk in the railroad office by the name of Cook that everybody liked. <laughs> railroad logic, okay? So, everybody's okay on where the railroads were, and when they got here, and, okay, because that's two questions on the test. <laughs> The railroad did run through High Street until 1936, and we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll tell that story. In 1936, the High Street line was torn out at government expense, and it was truncated. There was an industrial track that came in, the Reading continued. 1976, all of this was torn out. It was the line south of Carlisle was damaged in the 72 flood, and all of that was torn out. So today, what we have pretty much is just the line that goes through, the, the new freight line, goes to the west end of town and does some switching there. There's no customers on the, the old part of the, the Cumberland Valley in, in Carlisle anymore. The railroad stations will be located on High Street, the first block of High Street, and Penn Street for the Pennsylvania Railroad, and then at Gettysburg Junction. There's a series of stations down there that I find to be, be pretty interesting. Strangely or sadly, the record of what happened in the early years of the railroad is not very complete. A lot of it wasn't covered in the newspapers, a lot of it wasn't covered in the annual reports for the railroad, and the tax records and the deeds records are, are pretty incomplete and sketchy. So from 1837, as far as I can tell, into the 1850s, the Cumberland Valley and all the towns that it went to tended to use waiting rooms in hotels and had no ticket offices and no stations. So 
the, the Cumberland Valley Railroad, and most of us think of it in its later years when they were pretty well to do and successful, at the very beginning they were undercapitalized, they were very cheap, and they were very frugal. And, and that we do see in the newspapers fairly frequently is the, the reference to the, how tight and cheap the Cumberland Valley Railroad was. Um, Frederick Watts. So the first information that we find is a guy by the name of Peebles Matthews. I think his brother was Bam Bam. <laughs> and Peebles was from Shippensburg, and he wrote of, of his experience in Shippensburg. And he said that in Shippensburg, which kind of matches up, prior to 1850, there were no ticket offices. You bought your tickets on the train. And there was no depot in Shippensburg before 1860, which tends to match what we'll see in Carlisle. He says that tickets were first sold in a, a drugstore down there about 1850, which, which kind of tends to, to match up to what we find. The first reference that I find in the tax records, 1843, the company had a quarter lot, a two-story plastered railroad office. Now, back in that day, if somebody called your building plastered, it's probably stucco, but that was kind of a sideways reference to calling it a cheap, crummy-looking building. <laughs> okay? So, where that was, I have no idea. I know it was in a ward which put it possibly on High Street. In 1850, John Noble is listed as owning that quarter lot, which was a two-story railroad office. Um, and what that boils down to, as near as I can tell, is the corner of High and Pitt Street over where the uh, JFC building is, where the station was. And I'll, I'll explain why I think that's where it was. But there was, the only thing that, that supports that is that when the new station was being built in 1891, the Sentinel said that somebody had told them that the original ticket office for the railroad was where the new depot was to be built. And those properties were owned by Noble, and they were quarter lots. Now, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but 1852 is the first reference that we see in the, the newspaper. And what they're saying is whoops, that they're now accommodating passengers. And that's confirmed by the annual report of the Cumberland Valley Railroad for 1852. The railroad spent almost $200 fitting up passenger rooms and offices in Carlisle. So that would be that quarter lot owned by Noble. And if what the Sentinel is saying is correct, it would have been located in one of these buildings. This is the site of the 1891 station. Uh, the brick restaurant is probably that building. Well, probably, well, it is right there. Um, so a quarter lot would very likely be one of these buildings. This is the Adams Express office. That may have been the railroad office. I don't know. It could have been any, any one of those buildings. But they were owned by the Noble Estate uh, and, and passed on. Most of these buildings were torn down when the 1891 station was built. By that time, the, the, other, the railroad station was across the street. So the next thing we find is 1862, Noble sells a lot, 43 feet, 7 inches, kind of a unique dimension. I don't know how they derived that, that number. And subsequently built a three-story depot and office building. That's described in an article in the, the Carlisle Herald. That building was next to the mansion house. The mansion house is this building. It's now the, later became the James Wilson. This is the original three-story 1862 Cumberland Valley Railroad Station. The first floor was the railroad station. The second floor were the corporate offices. The third floor was connected to the hotel. <coughs> they subsequently, in the 1870s, built a one-story addition. Both these buildings still exist. And after they moved out in the 1891 period, they were sold over to the hotel. They became part of the hotel property. So um, I wish I worked there as a bellboy when I was in high school, back in the 1970s. It was still a hotel, and I wish I had known that. I would have torn a place apart looking for artifacts, but I haven't done this out recently. As I said, 1872, Noble sells an adjacent lot, and they build a one-story baggage and women's, women's waiting room in 1875. And the newspapers thought that was great, that now the women could be separated from the men, the language, the atmosphere, a lot of things drastically improved for the women um, when that was done. So that station continued to operate. It's, it's, we don't have a picture of the one-story building, but I did pull the, the sandboard map, and you can see here's the three-story building that matches up there, and the one-story building. For many years, that was Price Finance, and it's, it's now part of Safe Harbor. There was a bar in there. 
if, if you've ever been in there, I don't think it's open to the public anymore, but those buildings still exist, um, although not as, as railroad buildings. So that was still about 1890. Now, you have to keep in mind, and when I go through the pictures of the Carlisle Passenger Station, in that time period, the passenger station in a town reflected the quality of the town and kind of set the public image and the public tone for the railroad. And Carlisle's railroad station was pretty plain and not fancy. You waited inside the building. When the train came, you had to go out into the weather. The streets weren't paved. And it doesn't show up as well here as it does maybe in a couple other slides. But they had what I would call um, expended fuel cells. <laughs> from the horses and the mud and the rain and the wind and the weather so it, it wasn't very you know accommodating or most other towns for their railroad stations had fancier buildings they had platforms porticos where you could be protected from the weather Carlisle never had that and Carlisle was sensitive about that they were always sensitive we always competed with Chambersburg as kind of our sister town and eventually Chambersburg got a very elaborate station with a high level <coughs> platform and station. We never really got that. Um, but by the 1890s, we were in need of improvement. And in December of 1889, we see the first reference that there's going to be a new railroad passenger station in Carlisle. And just to kind of help you set the, the tone of what architecture was, the Union Fire Company's building was built in 1889. So it and the railroad station are contemporary. They use some of the same stone. So this is a similar design elements of the period. So the paper, of course, and the railroad described it as artistic and handsome, and it was going to be a fine modern structure. Now keep those quotes in mind when we get to the completed building <laughs> and read what the paper had to say then. The contract was given to a local guy, a um, local contractor to build, and the model is up here. You're welcome to take a look at that. And this is the floor plan for the model. This would be High Street. So we had the men's waiting room, the women's waiting room, the ticket office, I think this is the baggage room, there's toilets, this is the smoking room, and this is the express office. And it's very accurately captured in the model here. Not very big. When you look at the numbers that are available, and that there were probably somewhere between 100 and 200 people a day using the Cumberland Valley Railroad in and out of Carlisle. So it wasn't that many. So they didn't need a very big station, which is kind of surprising. By the time this was built, the trolley was also not complete, but was being built from Carlisle to Harrisburg. And whether that influenced their design or not, I don't know. And one thing that is kind of interesting is that never in any reference to the Cumberland Valley Railroad, we see female and male facilities, but I've never seen any reference to white or black. There's no, that I'm aware of, any discrimination at any time on the part of the railroad. Um, which I think is a pretty positive comment, pretty interesting. Now the station was supposed to be fairly quickly built. They wanted to have it done two or three months. It took a long time. It went so slowly that the Sentinel commented that the regulars had, had quit going to watch the construction. There were problems with snow, stones, wood, all sorts of different issues they had as they built it. Um, and the, the, the spectating public, probably the old retired guys, <laughs> didn't even go watch anymore. <laughs> So it's complete. So what did the newspaper say? Remember, this was going to be a handsome, modern superstructure. Everybody was a little disappointed by it. And a lot of the comments that you'll read later in the newspapers, it was dirty, it was dingy, it was out of date, it was an embarrassment. Kind of everybody says, boy, I'd love to have that building back, which would be neat. But the contemporary observers didn't think that much of it. So it opened May 23rd, 1891, total cost just under $20,000. And it looked like this. And again, this is kind of stylized, as we'll see with some of the street photographs. Uh, this is later years. Originally, it had a train order signal uh, in front of the building. But there's no platforms. There's no protection. When a train comes, you're out in the middle of the street. And you know, kind of, kind of primitive. Now, Here's what it, it looked like. The street wasn't paved, or if, if it wasn't macadamized, you can see that it was rather irregular, rather dirty. The station's visible here in the background. Here's the Hamilton restaurant. It was the Herald office then. You can see the, the horse buggy very close by there. 
A lot of people died, a lot of horses died, and a lot of carriages and, and wagons and buggies were ruined by the railroad in the course of its existence. Now, I didn't go into great detail with that, but I, I do have a story here where they hit a fish wagon and it scattered the fish all over the town. I'll talk about that in a minute. This is a little later view. This is also being in the 30s where automobiles. Here are the trolley tracks for the trolley that went to Mount Holly and Newville. So we had a kind of intermodal or multimodal uh, railway station, even then, all privately financed. No government support, no environmental impact studies. It just worked. It was kind of interesting. It looks to me that the wire has maybe been torn down, or is, I just don't see any wire supports here. But these would have gone out Pitt Street and then up south and out Parker and up to Newville and down Pitt the Ridge and out Ridge to the Holly Pike and going to Mount Holly. Um, gives you a little bit of an idea. Again, you see the, the baggage wagon. So when the train came, half the, the road would have been blocked. A um, little combination from the weather, you know, not necessarily a, a great situation. You see a few of the modern buildings there. That gives you the, the setting. There's what it would look like. Everybody thinks that's a pretty romantic, neat, old-fashioned picture. Well, at its peak, there were 13 passenger trains a day in each direction, which would have meant 26 trains a day went through downtown Carlisle. <laughs> Think the road diet's noisy? <laughs> OK? So that no doubt there were some issues with those trains. Now, they ran 24 hours a day, round the clock. They were, of course, concentrated in the day, and a lot of were commuter trains to Harrisburg and, and up and down the valley. But it would have been quite busy. It would have been quite noisy. There would have been a lot of attendant noise with the train stopping, air brakes, of course, bells, probably didn't use whistles. When they started out, there would be a lot of noise. There would be a lot of noise as the train was loaded and unloaded and passengers were going off. So it, it maybe wasn't as, as we call it. And again, um, this is the fish cart that got upset, made a general scatter of fine shad. <laughs> Which you have to think, did they capture every morsel of shad, or what did that smell like for a couple of days afterwards, <laughs> on top of the kind of background smells in, in Carlisle. But in 1870, as early as that, the Cumberland Valley Railroad started to discuss removing the trains from High Street. It was an operational bottleneck. It was a problem for the community. They said a lot of people were killed, a lot of people were injured, a lot of horses, animals. Um, a, lot of, a lot of gruesome stories. And it wasn't until the Great Depression in 1936 that the, the tracks got removed. They talked about it in council meetings for a long, long period of time. In 1934, a comment was made almost as a joke at a council meeting. Hey, let's put some money in the budget to take the tracks out of Carlisle this year. Lo and behold, there was federal funding available as part of the Great Depression. The Work Products Projects Administration, Public Service Commission, a lot of agencies get involved. And by June of 1936, they approved the project with the caveat that all the work had to be done by December. You probably couldn't even get the first permit in that time period of the day, you know, let alone, alone get it done. So they flew into things, and here's the way the costs were split out. The railroad was pretty smart here. If you had all these numbers up, they pay a very small percentage. State and federal monies went into it. The railroad paid about 34000 Carlisle paid. Their share was a little over $5,700, and then they paid $6,000 toward the new railroad station, which back then you could build a lot of buildings for $6,000. And as I said, it had to be completed by December 31st. So they very quickly went to work, and they added some second track from the area of about Pitt Street up to the west end of Carlisle so that they could run trains around the passenger station, or the, the passenger station. They had a little double track east of Latour Creek in Carlisle. And if anybody's really interested in that, we can talk later. That's another project. Um, most people would be pretty bored by that. But there, they had an additional track, and they had to build a new station. And after they got all that open, then they had to tear the other stuff out uh, and have all that done by the, the end of the year. So the work began in August. John Staff was the contractor, a fairly large contractor at the time. And they built this station on, between Pitt and West on Penn Street that's now known as Hope Station. They started that in August, and it was done by October. So it was, it was fairly quickly done. And moved the trains over at that point in time. Now, the last train on High Street was October 16, 1936. I think everybody's seen the pictures. There were kind of two last trains. The first 
was the last scheduled train. So this would have been the last regular train. And this train continued after the, the tracks were torn out on the new track. This was a, a 5400 series train that would have run from Hagerstown to Harrisburg. And it would have connected with trains in New York, Philadelphia, Washington, Baltimore, all points on the Pennsylvania Railroad. And again, you get an idea of what the impact was on High Street when the trains went through town. And by that point, we're talking some pretty good size locomotives, some pretty good size cars. The frequency at this point, 1931, I think, was only 11 trains in each direction, or 22 trains a day. So the, the frequency had dropped off a little bit, but it was still significant. So last regularly scheduled train. Then they had a special train. And this is the one everybody's seen the pictures of. And this is kind of interesting. Here is the old Cumberland Valley Railroad Station. This is the James Wilson the Mansion House. The Cumberland Valley, and then the addition of the Cumberland Valley, this is a telephone building now. Boy, if we could have saved the building, wouldn't that have been neat one to save? Yeah. Um, this is the, the last train. This train was staged on the west end of town, and it, after the last scheduled train, it pulled up. They did a little ceremony. There were 1,500 seats they sold for 10 cents a ticket. <laughs> and they had a little ceremony where they tore up the track. One of those people is the mayor, and the other one is probably from the railroad. Um, John Fowler, the attorney, who played an interesting role in this, is up <clears throat> on the train actually talking probably at that point. And they ceremonially, ceremoniously removed a piece of rail, and then all the college students quick grabbed all the spikes and everything that was loose before the locals could get them and took off. So they're dispersed, Lord knows where. Um, but the train had not even really left until they they started to, to tear the rails up. So what that train did, it now proceeded east on High Street. It went out to the junction at QN or Watts, cleared that, and then it backed up the new freight line and back past the station. So what we're seeing is that this is the same train that was on High Street, became the first train at the new station on Pitt Street. <laughs> and it going out, well, actually this direction, and then back up. You can see the double track that was added, that ended about Pitt Street, so that a train could be stopped here and they could run freight trains around it. Um, that was torn out probably in the 1950s. And you see Carlisle's railroad station. It's so new that they don't even have the sign that says Carlisle up yet. And there was still some more work to do. If anybody's worried, the sign that says Carlisle has been preserved. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> or posterity. But that was before it was put up. And that was the, the opening ceremony. So those people for 10 cents got about a four mile ride. And the railroad made 100, well, 50, no, $150. So that was kind of the, the PRR passenger stations. The last local trains, by 1952, the spring of 1952, there were two local trains that ran pretty much between Hagerstown and Harrisburg, were designed for commuters from the Cumberland Valley and the Harrisburg and back in the afternoon. And one through train that ran from Harrisburg to Hagerstown and then connected and had good connections to the south to go to Roanoke and down into Tennessee and New Orleans. That stopped in February 25th, on well, February 25th, 1962. That was the last regularly scheduled passenger train in Carlisle. There was an excursion train in 1964. Jim Bradley was there and got a picture of it. That went to either Atlantic City or one of the world's fairs. And that was the last passenger train in Carlisle. There was a steam passenger train in 1985, but it did not stop at the station. It went, as I recall, to the west end of town. So you can see that by 1964, that second track has been torn out. There's the sign that's been saved. And the station sat there for many years and then became Hope Station. Now, there's another series of railroads. Is everybody OK? Any questions so far? We'll get questions at the end. If I go too slow, we'll give me the sign to speed up. OK. <laughs> So we get down to South Mountain Junction. The building that's East Step Electric was the original station, as near as we can determine, that was built in 1870. And if you get down and look at it, it's got some neat architectural features. But there's more to the story that emerged as I, I went through this. Of course, this is the current East Step Electric. Um, and just to kind of give you your bearings, Lowler Street would be back here. Wingers would be off to the left. The original railroad, the Cumberland Valley, would be on this side of the building. And where these trailers are is where the railroad branched off to go across High Street over by scales, just to help you get your, your bearings. The South Mountain Railroad would have looked something like this in its early years up until maybe the 18, 
1880s when the, the Philadelphia and Reading took over, and it, it became a little bigger, but not that much bigger. The original railroad, as I said, went to Hunter's Run, turned, went to Pine Grove in 1884, it was extended to Gettysburg. A very important connection for the Cumberland Valley. It generated a lot of traffic. And the Cumberland Valley Railroad actually built a two-story station of their own at South Mountain Junction, next to the East Ed building, that they own, but it's set on Reading property. And there's no pictures that anybody knows about um, that we could find. This is the original East Step electric building, or the original station, it's pink, it's, it's brick. The two-story passenger station was built to the east of that, and then it had a waiting shed. This would have been the configuration in 1886 when it was, was fairly new. The first floor was the Cumberland Valley passenger station, and that would have been used to interchange passengers that came in or went out of the South Mountain Railroad from the Cumberland Valley. Those people were going to Gettysburg to tour the battlefield or coming back, or during the summer especially, there were an extreme number of excursion trains went to Pine Grove Furnace, to the park at Pine Grove Furnace. So it was a very busy station, a very prospering place, and unbelievably, no, no pictures. And the reason there's no pictures is it burned down in 1902, February 1902, in the middle of a blizzard. And pretty interesting story when you read the fire department accounts of that. Um, they were still hand pulling steamers in Carlisle in 1902. Just three years later, the first car caught fire in Carlisle, and they still hadn't got fire horses. Carlisle didn't buy fire horses until the first airplane landed here. Just an aside. But when you read the accounts of the fire, and they were hand pulling that fire apparatus from the Union Firehouse and the Cumberland Firehouse down East Lowther Street through eight, ten inches of snow and drifts and blizzards, and until they got there, the building had burned down. That still happens today. But anyway, <laughs> so there, there's no pictures. So after that was, well, let me just touch base. That expanded over the years. This is in 1897. This is the East Step Electric, or I'm sorry, here's the East Step Electric building. This is the Cumberland Valley Railroad Station. The first floor was the Cumberland Valley Railroad. The second floor, the Gettysburg and Harrisburg had offices. There was a little shelter to the east of that. You can see the Cumberland Valley, main and siding. So they had two tracks and the Gettysburg and Harrisburg. Pretty busy place that you could go across here. And there was also a small warehouse built um, on the west end. All of that burned in the, the 1902 fire. And a pretty interesting situation. Trains can, now after the fire, the East Step building, the original building, was rebuilt to be used by the CV, the Cumberland Valley Railroad, as a depot. So it, that continued to operate as a, a station, and trains continued to stop there until 1931. And primarily, I think, some interchange with the Reading. The Reading's passenger service on that line ended by 1935, maybe a little bit earlier. The trolley was there, which would have taken away some of it, um, but also probably for the military facility there. And when we read about the accounts of the Indian students that came to Carlisle and got off the train, they would probably have used the station on East Lowler Street rather than the downtown Carlisle station. We know, in fact, that the first group got off at that station. So that was a pretty significant spot that um, was fairly new to me. This was rebuilt after 1903, the original 1870s building with a little building beside, and I suspect that those are probably the toilet facilities out there. Um, they couldn't put them anywhere else. So that's the, those are the Cumberland Valley Railroad stations and the, the South Mountain. And then the third group of stations was the Reading Railroad. The Reading took over the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad in 1891. And when they did, they had grand plans. Now, I won't maybe diverge on the whole thing, but when the Reading took over the Gettysburg and Harrisburg, they also took over what became called the PHP of the Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and Pittsburgh. Remember the old South Penn Railroad back in 1883? Well, that was partially a Reading Railroad scheme to get them to the west. When that fell through, the Reading developed a plan to build to Shippensburg to connect with the Western Maryland, and then they went west, eventually went west from there to compete with the Pennsylvania Railroad. It's a longer story than that, but I'll, I'll keep it fairly short. But in 1891, when the, the Reading took over the Gettysburg and Harrisburg and the PHP, they came in force to the Cumberland Valley to compete with the Cumberland Valley Railroad. They were arch rivals, and 
Part of that was they were going to compete for passenger service. So they established a new ticket office diagonally across from the Cumberland Valley Station on West High Street. It would have probably been in the area where the telephone building is now. Can't really determine with accuracy. And they operated a shuttle service from there down to their railroad station. Initially was on High Street about where the Dunkin' Donuts is. I'll explain that a little bit better in a minute. So it was just as convenient for you to go to the Reading Station on High Street. They just shuttled you down on East High Street so they could be, be competitive. They converted part of what was then the freight house, and some of us here might remember the freight house that was torn down only years ago, like within the last 10 or 15 years, um, down on East High Street. That would have been this building, which is about where the Dunkin' Donuts is now, just to help orient yourself. This is the scales. The street arrangement was much, much different. South Spring Garden Street is here. This was York Street, it's no longer there. Um, but they did that in 1891. Then in 1892, they built a new depot, which was directly across the tracks. This is the Scales building, directly across the tracks where the old locomotive house was. And that building looked like this. And that was the Reddings, the Philadelphia Redding, or the Redding Railroad, the Gettysburg Harrisburg Railroad Station in Carlisle. These are the tracks that cross High Street and would come out at the 1870 depot, what's East Step Electric. The rails are still in on the other side. There's a fence there, and it's probably private property. This was most recently a video store. It is now vacant. And this, as we'll see, is just kind of a, a parking area. This is the Scales building back in the day. This is a, a passenger engine. If you've ever seen that picture at Scales mm -hmm. or around, it was taken somewhere between 1916 and 1920. And there's people that really get into this, but they can tell that by the way the Numbers are here, and the headlight, and that, and there's all, I don't <laughs> I take it from good authority that that's when that picture was taken, in case you're curious. But that's the crew on a passenger train at the station that's, that's off to the right. Wish they would have got that. That train would look somewhat like this, and probably look very similar to this up until 1935. This is out at, at Mill Street, and it's a Jim Bradley photograph about 1935 of the mixed train. That's what the mixed train the, the Carlisle would look like in the, the later years of the Reading. The station, as I said, set to where the, the store was. This is the old railroad right away, and again, this is the old warehouse that we, we saw. So that was the, the Reading's entry into Carlisle. They built that in 1891 to, to compete uh, with the, the Pennsylvania Railroad. Some odds and ends, we talked about the trestle. This would be the West Market parking lot now. Here's the Letour Creek and East Street would be about here, so this was the trestle. This flooded in 1902 and was level with the tracks. There's a, a postcard of that. That's why there's such a good bridge at Alexander Spring, because that bridge was washed out in that, that flood as well. But this existed till 1936. The good road was on the south side. This was a ford. There was no bridge here. Um, and that's, that's what Carlisle would look like in that end of town until 1936. Nobody here remembers that, I'm sure, but... Um, no, okay, I didn't think <laughs> Just kidding. Um, this is the west end of Carlisle. This is the subway, which was put in. This is the trolley that went to Newville. This would have come down High Street to Parker, Parker to South, and then out pit that we saw earlier goes through the subway and turns left. This was Cook Tower, or WF. This is the junction where the freight bypass and the original railroad went, came together. So that, that's what that looked like back in the day. Of course, that's all going now. The famous God Bless Reed McCormick sign would have been right here. Just a, mm -hmm. I think we should restore that. <laughs> you know, you know, cloud fund it. But, and this is the east end of Carlisle, what was known as QN and later Watts where the original line whoops, went through Carlisle. This would bring us in behind Frog and Switch by the Ice House by Wenger's, and then across the West Market parking lot up High Street. This is the freight bypass that, that turns off. This is now the, probably the road to the post golf course. Wasn't there then. Um, and there was an interlocking tower there. Would have been an operator. Um, a long time ago. Eventually that was closed, and the control of that interlocking was taken over by Penn Road SF Tower down in Shippensburg. Um, but just to give you an idea of, of some of the, the railroad development. So just a quick summary. 
you know, the Cumberland Valley depots were on High Street, probably at Pitt and High in the area where the JFC and the, is now. Then went across the street, then came across the street, then went out on Penn Street. There's the Cumberland Valley Depot at South Mountain Junction, Gettysburg Junction. And that was the Cumberland Valley Station from 1884 to 1931. And then the Reading Railroad built their station on the south side of East High Street in 1891 and was there until 1957, although their last train was about 1935 or 1935. So that, that's the story of the railroad stations of Carlisle, pretty much everything I know. Um, the book, I include a lot of the newspaper articles so you can get a lot of the detail and what happened when and the diagrams, there's a few more diagrams in there and maybe a couple more pictures, but can I answer any questions, any questions, any comments? Yes? Hey, Randy, the 1891 station that was turned out to be so disappointing to the community, what do you think they expected of it? Because we look at that building now, and wish it had been observed, it looks very quaint and interesting, besides the lack of a platform, and what were they perhaps thinking they were going to get? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't really know, but if, if you take a look at the Shippensburg stations, the Newville stations, they were not even as elaborate. And, and, I, mean, I mean, they were just plain brick, a little bit of, of wood trim, an Italian kind of style. Whether it was something like that, or I don't know. It was, and it had central heat, they had electric, they had gas in it, which were all big things. I mean, electric had only been in Carlisle for four years by that time. Um, actually three. Um, so nobody ever said, it, 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 which is typical. The naysayers always nay, but they never say what we would like to have seen. Um, and Shippensburg Station at that time was still down in the old part of town. It's still down there. Um, was a public opinion office. And that was maybe a little airier, a little lighter on the inside, but that had the train sheds that, that protected you. The train sheds were not common at all on any of the, the Cumberland Valley stations in Cumberland County. You know, the, the Pitt Street station had station platforms or, or, or roofs over the, the platforms when it was built, but none of the other stations, Mechanicsburg, if you look at that, Shireman's Town, White Hill, uh, none of those had really covers over them. So they didn't, but they had a monopoly, I guess, so they didn't have to, yes? Any comments, uh, Randy, on the Harrisburg and Potomac Railroad and its relationship to the South Mountain Railroad? There wasn't really any, but there kind of was. <laughs> and the, the question was the relationship between the South Mountain and the Harrisburg and Potomac. The Harrisburg and Potomac Railroad was the predecessor to the Philadelphia Harrisburg and Potomac. The Harrisburg and Potomac Railroad was originally invention, envisioned to go roughly from, and shoot me because I'm condensing a lot here, but roughly Shepherdstown, West Virginia to Harrisburg, roughly. It was backed by the Oil family, primarily, of Newville, and it was intended to serve the iron industry along the South Mountain, and, and they had other iron interests. And it was kind of a standalone thing of not much interest to the Reading Railroad at that point in time. Now that started about 1870, a little bit before, but the land track down about 1870. That ended up, it went bankrupt with the oils in the 1880s, early 18, well, late 18, about 1887, I think the oils went bankrupt. It was 1887. And, but the oils knew the people from the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. I mean, those guys were all interconnected. Um, but it didn't have any value until the South Penn Project died, and finally died. Now the South Penn Project died about 1885 where they stopped work, but it wasn't really officially terminated, and everybody realized that it was done until about 1888. So the Philadelphia and Reading interest picked up one of South Penn, and then picked up the Harrisburg and Potomac to make the Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and Pittsburgh, and become the bridge line. So there, there wasn't, that much direct connection there. Now the South Mountain was originally built by the interest from Pine Grove. Jay Cook, um, I'm going to say more, some other well-to-do interests that were related to Pine Grove that were friendly to the Cumberland Valley Railroad. And the Cumberland Valley Railroad loaned some money toward that and mortgages and 
there were some interrelationships, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth. But that went broke, or they had fight while it went broke. And it went through a couple ownership changes. It went to, and I'm simplifying here, and bear with me, um, into like the Thomas Iron of the Lehigh Valley interest, and then came out of those and came back to the local interest. And when that happened, then the Philadelphia and Reading kind of got a hook in it in 1884. And in 1891, the Reading took the South Mountain over and became kind of the sole owner of it. At which point, the South Mountain and the PHP became intertwined very strongly, same control, same railroad, I mean, very. So it was kind of informal, but it was formalized, but after the, the Harrisburg and Potomac. I don't know if that answers your question or. Thank you. Yes? The South Mountain Railroad, was there any right of way still that you could see between Carlisle and Mount Holly going towards Gettysburg? Oh, absolutely. Where? Um, any, any landmarks? Yeah, there's a, well, if, if you go down to East Step Electric, you can see it there a little bit, and you can see a little bit traces on South Spring Garden Street. But then there's a, a rail trail that starts at Leetort Park, and you're not really on the right of way until you go past the school. There's a detour. It's kind of hard to, you go down South Bedford Street, and then you turn back, I think it's Highland Avenue, and you come out by the school. And once you get, you'll realize you're back. You can walk on the right of way from there to Bonnie Brook. At the other end of the trail, it, it, it dead ends on Bonnie Brook Road. From there, it goes cross country. If you have topo maps, you can see traces of it, and there's a lot of very visible sections. Some are driveways and some have been removed. When you get out to Zion Road, you can see it cut across. And from Zion Road back to Carlisle Junction, your PPG, which is probably private property and you shouldn't go on it, but you can find it there, uh, although it's been pretty heavily washed out. The rail is still in from Mount Holly to Hunter's Run, and then from Hunter's Run, the Appalachian Trail runs on it, um, not quite to Tolan, and then it was a county rail trail from about Tag Run, is it? Or Mountain Creek? Mountain, Mountain Creek Campground. From there up and up at Pine Road, you can get one. I think it's Ice House or Old Railroad Road. Or... Yeah. Randy, just to add to that, I mean, a sore spot for us down at Pine Grove Furnace area is the lack of a connection that used to be from the Laurel Lake Dam area. There was a, a, a hiker biker rebuilt type thing has collapsed because of conflict with private ownership. And there was some talk, what, five, ten years ago, and Stephanie Williams was talking about a bypass, and I'm not sure if that ever actually happened, although it was discussed in the newspaper. So the right of way through that section is all overgrown, except where it's going through someone's front yard along Pine Grove Road. You can't actually do any of it right now. And, and, and you know, of course, about the caboose that was installed there for a while, which is gone now. Yeah, Tom Bowman's. Uh, I'm not sure the other one. Yes. And the sad thing with that, the county built that rail trail, and they only leased it for 25 years, which when it started sounded like a long time, but 25 years is unfortunately pretty short. But yeah, there's a lot of traces of that, and then it's still in service from Hunters Run south to Gettysburg, although Rain. it's been portions relocated to Gettysburg. Rain. Probably the easiest uh, part that anybody would recognize would be the tracks that went across their Craigheads, their the old feed mill. Yeah, Craigheads, there's a, a bridge there, and then you see it pretty good at Zion Road. It crosses Zion Road in the area of Lander. Yeah. So it's it's visible, yeah. And if you get on Google Maps, it's or wide maps, you can see a lot of it there. So where will the new rails and trails that's coming from um, mm -hmm. where will it end up? Just off Allen Road, we have a source subject matter expert here, um, but um, Allen Road, there's a little trailer park up there. Meals, is it? Uh, Levy. Levy. Levy, okay. And, and the trailhead's in, there's a parking area, and you can hike that now for about a mile. It's neat, and it's, it's worth going. And the Alexander Spring Bridge, which was built in 1902, it's flood replacement, 02 or 05? 02. 02 is in, and there's some neat features of that, and you have to get your feet wet to see all of them, but there's pictures where the masons or somebody carved on it, but, and it goes for a mile, and that's going to be extended from the end of the Newville Trail, almost now for the high school, I'm told. Yeah. So they continue. The high school 
school? Yeah, at the high school, like in Newville. Mm -hmm. So it's there's some right of way issues with that at this point. Yes. Um, I went to college on, in the 60s from a uh, hope station. Hmm. And I was on one of the last passenger trains. Okay, now where was... And if we'd come to Carlisle late at night and my father would let me go by myself, he got somebody to take me. Okay. And where was Hope Station? It would come into Hope Station. And then I'd get off. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I had a, a room. And I would get off and... Uh, down around Roanoke and make my eight o'clock class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it went through Carlisle and I'd have to look at the timetable. And I was just able, lucky enough, in the 60s, it ran late at night. Like the one went this way, something like 11 o'clock and the other one maybe 1.30, 2 o'clock. It did stop in Carlisle um, and then went down the valley to Hagerstown and then became a Norfolk and Western train. But got to see that go down and up and down the valley a couple of nights. And, um, but that was the last, it was, it was intended to connect with the Norfolk and Western trains that, that did go to Rona. So, yeah, it was pretty neat. Uh, yes? Uh, I'm not clear on, uh, if you wanted to travel west on the Reading from Carlisle, would that, uh, how far would you get to still be on the Reading? To Shippensburg. Okay, so Reading ended basically at Shippensburg. It, it did, yes. Um, if, if we want to, Split here is it, it, it technically ended well. You could say Oregon, you could say Reading and Chippensburg, but there was an end to end connection with the Reading and the Western Maryland at Chippensburg. And but they had through train service, so they didn't stop. Like a lot of times, if the Reading ended, their locomotive would come off and a Western Maryland locomotive, they didn't do that, they ran through passenger service. But th that passenger service on the Reading Railroad in the Western Maryland was never that successful, and it was short-lived. I'm thinking that that ended by the 20s. The last passenger train that ran on the Reading was from Harrisburg to Gettysburg, and that was in the 1940s that that ended. So it would have come up to Carlisle Junction near PPG and then going south to Gettysburg, um, 43, 44, somewhere in that time period. Carlisle was 1935 at, at that end. But there was never, the Reading had big hopes that there would be phenomenal passenger traffic on the line through Shippensburg. They even talked to sleeper cars and parlor cars and fancy, and it never came to be. But they dreamed a lot of big dreams. <laughs> they were sort of like internet speculators. <laughs> the trolley to Newville, did it follow the Newville Road, and when did it come out? It, it followed the Newville Road. You can see traces of that. Um, for the most part, if not the whole way, for most of the way, it was on the north side of 641. You can see some traces of that, some bridges, bridge abutments. The most visible landmark is up at Cemetery Hill. It veers away from the road and goes through a deep cut at Cemetery Hill and then into Newville. That came out, I'm going to say, around 1923. I'd have to check because that and the Mount Holly Railroad were kind of affiliated. They went bankrupt, stopped, and then came back for a short period of time and then came out. But that didn't come until about 1910. It was very late. It was stupid that was even built. I'd love to have written it, but from a business standpoint, it was, you know, that's when Carlisle, well, that, Carlisle got fire horses in 1910 and they were building a trolley line. So you know you're behind the times if you. <laughs> Just, we're lucky you know the canal. Yeah, look, yeah. There was a survey for that as part of the Cumberland Valley, and um, it was determined to be impractical. But that that would have been neat. To have a canal down. It's the only thing we never did. Um, that was across the river in Harrisburg. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.